Hello, my name is John Macero, and tonight I will be interviewing the at-large candidates. Our first candidate tonight here is Mr. Todd Sacco. Hi, Todd. Hi, John. How are you doing? I'm good. Todd, why don't you introduce yourself to the community and kind of tell them, more importantly, why are you running? <laughs> introduce myself to the community, I think, is probably something I've done uh, already quite I'm, enough. I'm sure you have. <laughs> People know me, but in fairness to those who may not, um, my name is Todd Sacco. I'm uh, over a half a century resident of the town of Winthrop, Massachusetts. On a, a married to a beautiful woman named Melissa, a former secretary at the Winthrop Public Schools uh, during John Macero's time and after. Now a, a secretary for the administrators over in Malden. Malden Public Schools. Yeah, yes. yeah, Malden Public Schools. I have two uh, amazing boys. Um, and I want to pause on that for a minute because one of the things that I'm very proud of, um, and this is, this, is, this is kind of an old, I don't want to say why, like a parable, I guess you'd call it, or uh, a euphemism, I'm losing the words here, but if the saying, your children are a reflection of their parents, is true, I could not be more proud of myself and my children. Um, my children, to a man, no matter who you ask, they will tell you they are polite, courteous, respectful and kind children. Um, they don't get involved in any of the talking behind people's backs or the bullying in schools. They are, they are my wife and I's pride and joy. And it makes me proud to know that I was part of raising those two children. If I do nothing else in life, that is my greatest accomplishment. And why I'm running partly is motivated by that, by my children and by my youth. Um, I don't know if you've heard this, John, before, but excuse me. During one of my uh, meet and greets, I, I have a kind of a canned speech for my meet and greets, and uh, I will tell the public this. I moved here from East Boston when I was three and a half years old. Oh, okay. I lived in a two bedroom back alley house behind my grandparents. You know, literally, you'd walk out my grandparents' back door, you would take 15 steps, and you'd start walking up the steps to our house. It was all asphalt, you know, the to whole Italian thing lawn furniture that's on asphalt covered in plastic. Two bedrooms, five people, one bath. My father was a tile setter. Um, we moved here and I felt like, well now I knew what Beverly Hills is, I know what Beverly Hills is, but then when I was a kid I didn't know, but I thought it was the greatest place on earth. To me it was like Disney World sure. all year round. Sure. Beaches, salt marshes, and affordability. And this is what has become to me the biggest challenge of Winthrop is affordability. Our most important workforce cannot afford to live in the town they work in. Our teachers really can't afford to buy a house here. They have to share, they have to rent. You know, fire department, police department, all of our public service employees are either having to find work outside of town to live here or live outside of town to work here. Or perhaps they've married, correct, or inherited a home, but new young families are having a, are having a hard time moving here. And that, that's why I'm running. I'm hoping to do something uh, to help that. All right, well, thank you. You're thank welcome. you for that opening. So <clears throat> let's get right to the, um, the, the other stuff that's on the ballot. I know that's a big hot <laughs> item out there, which is the new fire station. How do you feel about that, Todd, the new initiative of the new fire station? So it's, it's funny that this is such a hot topic, first and foremost. And, and I'm not sure why this has become a, a question in, in the political world, for, for the candidates anyway, because we're not on the council. Uh, I, I am for the new fire station. But again, I'm not sure why my opinion is so important. I'm just like you. I'm just like every other Winthrop citizen. I have a vote, you have a vote. So let me ask you, mm -hmm. if I tell you, yes, I like it, I like the location, does that change your vote? No, because I like it and I like the location of it as well. I, but, but I think because you're a candidate, I think it's important for people to know what your opinions are on it. And I think it's also important for the fire station, you know, I think there's a lot of misinformation out there and I think it's important for us to understand what we are voting for as we take a look at it. But you might have had a different opinion of, I mean, are you good with the place that it's at, that they're talking about? So let me back up a little bit. You said something important. Right. Um, you said it's important for the people to know there's misinformation out there. Let's right. focus on the misinformation. Mm -hmm. Again, I'll go back to my opinion is irrelevant, but yes, there is misinformation out there. And to answer the question about the spot, 
I could make an argument against any spot that we've already vetted. I could make an argument for any spot that we've already vetted. I'll give you an example. The center, uh, the, sh the Pauline Street location, many people just would like to refurbish that. From the jump, we don't have 100 feet from the beginning of the sidewalk back to the fire station. It's out. That right there disqualifies that location unless domain take, domain take, domain take, domain take, and these would be aggressive domain takes or hostile, and they're not really that much different, but hostile versus what we're being told right now is a friendly domain mm -hmm. take. Mm -hmm. As far as the location, now, there's, now, as far as this current location, there are a lot of challenges like any location. The mm -hmm. challenge I just mentioned in the uh, Pauline Street, the center location, there are challenges with the middle school location. The challenges here are the businesses, which it's my understanding they will be taken care of. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, this, this is a fact, um, the businesses would be subject to that if the owner of the building sold it, regardless of who they sold it to. Any business that rents or leases in a, in a strip mall or a, a, an office building is subject, subject, subject to this type of occurrence. So while we can all feel bad for them, and I do, it's, it's not great, it's just a fact of life. And we've all dealt with the, you know, the, 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 the waves of, of life, the ups and downs. Um, it also presents potential challenges for turning radius and that. That's misinformation. Mm -hmm. Again, the apron, the, the vehicles are going to be back 100 feet. By the time they hit the street, they're going to be just about into the turns that they need to take. From the center fire station, they're already coming down Winthrop Street, so I'm not, you know, when they have to go to the point, so I don't have a concern about that. Um, so do I love the location? Not necessarily, but I don't hate it. And it, I don't think, uh, I don't think if more people would come to the meetings and, and hear what, the, what the, the, the committee has to say and besides just reading the questions online and take the tours and see well, but that brings me to that point. They need a new firehouse. Oh, 100%. Right. So, I mean, that's the important part here, right? So we can, we can debate over and over about where it could go. However, I'm pretty confident the fire chief has also said this is probably the best spot yes. for it. Yeah. I've got to respect that, and I've got to respect where our fire department needs in that in those particular areas so I'd be a little careful to say and agree with you that it's the best spot that is available at this time mm -hmm. the actual ideal spot from what I'm told from some of the retired chiefs is up on Revere Street going up over the hill there right near going into the Fort Banks like right that was a spot that was looked at years ago I guess but I'm you have Fort Banks there right now right, no, so, so if that you, can't and, happen and, now and, and, <laughs> and, and speaking of that not to you know to but people have talked about, well, why don't we just move the Fort Banks to where uh, the middle school is? Oh, boy. Well, it all sounds wonderful on paper, <laughs> yes, correct? Yes, it does, yeah. But that's now a $150 million oh, my project. God, a big project. Because MSBA does not going to give you any money for that. No, because they already so, did. All right. Well, let's move on. All right, good. So um, I know that you were on the school committee, so you've had some experience with municipal budgets, but you want to talk about what, what those experiences are or how you've dealt with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, well, first of all, I'm glad you mentioned that we ser I served on the school committee. I was happily uh, serving when you were superintendent. That in is fact, correct. I was part of the team that hired you. <laughs> that in fact, is true. I Full disclosure, that is true. That's right. I enthusiastically, <laughs> full-throated supported you, as I recall. Um, so my experience with municipal budgets is four years vast, I guess, if, if that's the mm. word you want to use. But it's with the most complex budgets in all municipal budgeting, which is education. Correct. And you could spend... As a, co a committeeman, you could spend 10 years on a school committee and still not know everything about the budget inside and out. And that's why business managers or good, really good chief financial officers are so important. Uh, but I was part of four, budget, four rounds of budgeting. I was part of four, uh, two rounds of contract negotiations. Um, I understand my weaknesses, right? I'm not a financial, I'm not an accountant. I didn't study that. I'm more of a big idea guy, uh, so I knew to leverage my my uh, my support, my business manager, my CFO. Then I was on the negotiating team. Mm -hmm. You know, I helped find money in our budget. You may recall, during my time on the school committee, we lowered user fees, we Im implemented a bus program, we uh, made full day kindergarten free, we settled the teachers' contract, and we increased revenues to the budget 
We added Latin. We brought back uh, music. And uh, I want to say there was one more writing. We brought back a writing program. And this was, was under the Linda Bro uh, when she was the, the principal of the high school. Mm -hmm. and we did all this without laying off a single teacher. G Gail Conlon. I'm sorry, Gail Conlon, you're correct. Um, Linda's her sister. Yep. You got it. I, I was close, though. Yeah, you were. Uh, sorry, Linda. Sorry, Gail. Um, <laughs> but anyway, um, you, you threw the curveball. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> no, I mean, you. I, I, but I, I, I have that, that experience. Right. You know, I know I, I've been through it. I've been through all the budget cycles. I know what to expect. But, so and now, I'm even part of it now as a counselor. Right. So now, well, that's which leads me to the next question. Right. right. So now, as a counselor, you're elected to the council. What do you perceive your role related to the school district and the school budget? So there really is no perception. We have no oversight on the school district. So my role is the same as any other citizen, private citizen with respect to oversight of the school district. That being said, I vote one of nine to appropriate or respond to the school committees and the, and the, and the superintendent's request for money. We are presented with what, uh, uh, level services, needs based, and then the pie in the sky or the, 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 the grand well, Usually, the grand but, finale. But, but, but a lot of times by the time the budget gets to you, I would imagine, if I, if I recall, it's already been vetted through the school committee. And maybe that's how it was years ago. Maybe that's changed. And then the town manager has put a his, their, their stamp on it, right, that right. says this is what's going to go there. If that's what, how it is now, really kind of the same thing anyway. We're still just voting. And I do know, in, in, right, and I do know in, in Winthrop, the finance committee, met with the superintendent right. quite a bit, and they still do that, and there's a lot of discussion that goes on, and then the, those folks from the city council could come in attendance unless they're on the finance committee, right. you know, with that group. Well, that, so. and that, right, and that's so kind of an offshoot of what we're talking about here. I, I would like to be on the finance committee, and I also, um, should I be elected, I also want to be part of all the negotiation teams with the MWRA and, and the Massport. Uh, we have those mitigation packages coming up, and you know, we've got some ideas on, try to hire, okay. on how to try to make things a little bit better here in Winthrop. I'll, I'll give you an example. Sure. We all should have windows. All of us should have new windows and soundproofing wherever we want. That, that's the least. I'm not when you say all of us, you mean the whole, the whole town? The whole town. I'm not okay. saying that we're going to get that, but I will say this. I would, happily get, I would happily give preference to Precinct 3 and then my Precinct, Precinct 2, because we are the most impacted. We should be starting at least from Precinct 3, Cottage Hill areas, because, I mean, they're right, you know, more down Precinct 3, more down towards, you know, across from Euro, I mean, down Euro Beachway, but mm -hmm. all that area is really impacted by the flights. The flights are, uh, are, are kept up, I mean, excuse me, are going on beyond the, the, the hours they're supposed to stop. So we really need to start looking at all those things. I, I, it's funny you say that. I, I was out, I've been going to work out. And sometimes they go at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning and I see a plane flying over and I'm like, not supposed to be happening. Yeah, so it's an interesting point. Yeah. So a <clears throat> um, lot of discussion about the old middle school. I know we kind of got into a little of it because of the fire uh, house. But, and we're still talking about it. So <laughs> what's your vision of the future of this site? I mean, I'm, I'm surprised that I still am asking that question because we're, we're about almost 10 years since we've approved the school vote, which so, was in 2013. Right. So we're all, right. So we're what? Seven hundred thousand dollars in the hole. Seventy grand a year we're paying to keep that building minimally infested with rats. Minimally, they mean in mice and other things. I mean, we obviously have a routine um, de infestation or, or routine um, animal and pest control, but we're spending money on these things just for it to sit there and be an eyesore. Mm -hmm. So that's a problem. So seventy thousand dollars a year. First and foremost. Personally, I've had a lot of ideas about what to do with that building. Um, I don't know if it was you I mentioned it to, or maybe I was bouncing this off of Jeff Turco or maybe Lisa Howard. One of the things that's hard, we talked about our teachers living here. Mm -hmm. We own the middle school. One of the things I wanted to do a few years ago is turn it into um, apartments for teachers and make it part of their compensation package. We already own the building. They can pay for the heat. I, and again, who knows if it's feasible. I thought we should do a, a feasibility study to take a look at it and see if that's something that might work out for us because 
we have to start getting creative and thinking outside the box. And a lot of ideas outside the box are going to seem stupid at first and might not make it down to the next, you know, to the final three best ideas, but we have to start somewhere. And that's, that's what I was thinking for that building. I talk about responsible development a lot. To me, responsible development is not building places for people to live in Winthrop. I realize we have a housing problem, but we're not going to put a dent in that in Winthrop. Unfortunately, people got to go find someplace else to live. Uh, I hate to say it, we don't have enough space here to make the kind of density to build up the kind of housing that we can sustain. So um, responsible development is building, building things that attract people to come, spend their money, and then they go home. And they go, and so this, this facilities idea, this, yeah, this the idea the sports facility, yeah. I believe in it to the extent that we should at least try it. And I lived the experience. So my nephew is a really good hockey player, he lived up in Haverhill, played for a uh, private Catholic school, and was in tournaments at Marlboro. When I first time I went to Marlboro, there were two sheets of ice. The second or third time I went there, I think it was, there were three sheets of ice. I'm to understand now there are seven sheets of ice. And there are hotels and restaurants around there that are thriving. Um, so what's happening? There's, there's tournaments that come in, they, and they fly into Logan, and they all get rental cars or Ubers or whatever, and they travel into Marlboro, Framingham, whatever. You don't, we don't think some of them would come here? A quick Uber taxi ride away? I think it's worth a shot. And the best part of this is if I mean, we... if they're flying in, it's a great spot. In, in if the, they're in the state, you don't know, right? But right. if they're flying in, yeah, I can see that. So let me ask you, what do we think... What, what, was, what do we think the projected revenue is just for the lease, like 150 or 170 k a year? I think it's, right. let, let's call it 170 to be conservative. And you add 70 to that, because we won't be spending 70 anymore, and that's a $240,000 swing in our budget to the affirmative. Okay. I think it's worth trying. And then, allegedly, we'll be part of the, the success of it, too. We'll get incentivized by the success of the facility. Okay. So, thank you. Thank, you're welcome. So, Winthrop's initiated some additional fees in the last couple of years, and one is the annual trash fee per household. How do you feel about this, Mr. Sacco? So, before I, I get into my problems with it, let me just say, this isn't about the 160 bucks in the bags, okay. right? Partly, it's about the fact that we had a town manager previously who went ahead and, and signed a contract that he shouldn't have under the former council president's leadership. So the town, the councilors and the, and, the, and the town council president and the town manager, somewhat, I want to be fair, put us in that position. Um, the price, the cost was going up regardless. Um, so we need more money, I get it. Mm -hmm. But a fee is an end run around the two and a half process. At the end of the day, I don't care if it's a penny, it's our money, and you should ask us, not tell us, how much you're going to raise it. Because you have nine people deciding on a fee, and I believe it can only be raised like a point one zero one percent of the entire budget or something a year, max. They can't just willy-nilly raise it. I understand that it doesn't matter. Over time, it's just going to compound it as the, as the f cost of trash goes up, <laughs> you know, the budget goes up, which means that point zero one percent gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It just adds to between the water rates, and I know we're going to get to that, between the water rates, taxes going up 2.5% every year, the economy we're in right now in terms of inflation and the cost of milk and eggs. Um, you know, it, it, it's just another way that people on a fixed income, you know, we have a lot of retirees here, a lot of older folks that would like to remain in their homes and they're having to move to places like the Arbors. They don't really want to. I live next door to Frank Cavallari. He didn't want to go to the Arbors, but that was a decision that they had to make. I want to die in my bed, not to be glib or gloom, but I want to die in my bed. Is that going to be possible? I, I don't know. We should increase the abatement uh, percentage for the senior citizens who live here so that they okay. can do that. We should make them pay less because their values have gone up in their homes but not their income. And we just keep coming back to the taxpayer over and over again or the rate payer. So, it, so I want to get rid of it. But I want it to be a, a situation where I'd, oh, I'd like to try and, and remove it and remove all fees and have a vote, but have an override how, but, but to make then, up the money. Okay. 
Okay. Right. So that was the question Give I was the, going to have. Yeah. So, so you're so you're looking at you would be looking at an override to say to the yeah educate okay. the people. This is how much money we collect in fees every year, roughly. Let's vote to put this much in the budget and eliminate all those fees going forward. Okay. So let's go to the water rates because you you mentioned it earlier, yeah. and I know that that seems to always be a hot issue, and we always know when the water rates are coming out because. I know two days before it's coming just because I'll see it on Facebook, right? All of a sudden we, we know what's happening there. So what are your recommendations regarding the current rates and how do you help defray any additional increases and what, what has been going on that um, you might be coming across as far as the water? So, yeah. First of all, the biggest expense is infrastructure. We have, oh God, I forget the number of ma water mains. We have a lot of water mains that they all need to be replaced. Mm. We've been working through that and that's the bulk of the increases. But as far as I'm concerned, like I've always said, the sins of the past get paid for in the future. And the sins of the past is all those years we neglected maintenance and moved the money into places we shouldn't have and those, those mains weren't getting checked in a timely way. They weren't getting repaired or brought up to speed. And so now we are so far behind, we're having to fix them all at once. Preventative maintenance, routine maintenance, is something municipalities cannot do because they don't have the will to do it. Because it takes someone, or actually in our case, it's going to take five people. Do they not have the will or do they not have the funding? No, they don't have the will. Okay. At the end of the day, and we'll get to that question, yeah. at the end of the day, the town of Winterbest said, here's what you have. Your wife's customers say, the number of customers you get is the number of customers you get. If you can't afford to keep your lights on, you're done, mm -hmm. right? So we have the funding we have. If we want to increase it, we have to be very transparent with the public, tell them why we're increasing it, exactly where every dollar of it goes, wh why we're doing it. And I believe if we are fully transparent, we'll be a little bit more successful with, with two and a half overrides. Or potential, but I don't want to go there right now. I was going to say this is the second time you've talked about overrides. I know. So, but what's interesting about that is that when you when you're talking about the override, what you're, I I, I kind of understand, and you can tell me if I'm wrong or no, not. Go what ahead. you're saying is is that, look, we understand you get fees, we understand that there are we have these issues, but if we're transparent about those, why are we doing it this way? Let's just tell you what those costs are, and let's go for that override. Right. And, and so that everybody understands, kind of ba ba back when we did that menu item. Right. Okay. I, I think at the, I mean, John, if I may, yeah. the people of Winter, it's our money. And if we don't give you enough, you, I know what I'm going to do. Let me answer the question this way. If the town of Winthrop says, um, if the town of Winthrop says you're giving us this much money, and that's it. And, and I see uh, expenditures that I have to vote on that I know are going to put me in year two and three out of it. I'm going to vote no. The town said this is how much. End of story. The more control the people have over the money, the better it is for our local government. Well, it's, 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 it's their it's, money. Right. And it's an interesting point because some people have talked about it, and I'm not talking about here. It could be where I work and all of that. But, you sure. know, we're at a point in our, where we're at now where we should be looking at overrides every year because there are different expenses that you come up and whether or not we have to vote for them or not. You know, whether that's a decision that the, the residents need to make, right? So the, that, that's just something that was said on it. So I have been, I'm so glad you said that. Okay. I have been saying that for years. In fact, I forget what meeting it was, but I think it was a school committee meeting in the high school auditorium. Terry Delahanty was there. I believe it was a school committee meeting and I stood up and said, what we're doing here, I don't even remember what we were talking about, quite frankly, but I do remember saying what we're doing here is a complete waste of time until we come to the realization that if we're going to continue to do business the way we do it, we need an override every year. Well, that, that, if we want to add programs, <laughs> let's put it simply, if we want to add programs back to the school, if we want to maintain our buildings, if we want to maintain our sidewalks, if we, wanna, if we want to hire and retain the best people, we either need to override every year, or we need to find streams of revenue. Well, and it's something that they do down south a lot that you'll see is, you know, when I talk about south, you'll see, like, they'll, they'll vote for school board and stuff, but they always have the budget on. They vote for that budget, the community, not just 
the people that are there. Well, if you're talking Boca, Boca Raton or some of these other big bucks. Well, cities. I don't know. <laughs> well, we got about five minutes, so I want to <clears throat> keep moving on here. Sure. So if you're elected, you're one person out of nine in the town council, right? I mean, that's what it is. And But you might be very passionate about some of the things that you talked about here. Yeah. How do you get your colleagues to support your initiatives? It was like when I worked on uh, the school committee. I had to get, what were we, four? I needed four votes. Mm -hmm. The first thing I always do is see, see who has interest in the initiative, then understand their feelings on it, and then if, if we have to change the policy or the initiative a little bit to fit their, what they're looking for, I mean, you, you basically corral votes by gaining consensus. You gain consensus by making sure everybody's interests in the particular topic are met. Right? You gain consensus. So, for instance, if I wanted to uh, eliminate the user fees and all the fees and, and, and have the, the, the citizens vote to do that, I would have to talk to my colleagues and, and figure out who thinks it's a good idea and who would go for it with me. And then if it doesn't happen, you move on to the next thing. Okay. Okay. Um, and what communication tools are you going to use with the residents? You know, because a lot of times we hear that oh, I don't know what they're talking about, you know, nobody tells us anything or all things like that. And I, it's a common occurrence, but yet people are trying. So what? That's a great question. And uh, if you remember, a certain baseball player walked up to the plate one day and pointed to the, yeah. was it the right field fence or the left yeah. field fence? I, I, I'm about to do that right now. Okay. I'm going to be the only candidate, the only town counselor ever to have a show on Facebook every week where I will be there sharing what I can from the meetings, taking phone calls, taking questions. I will, that's how I will, that's how the way I will communicate very differently with the community than others. Um, I know there are some who like to do the um, coffee with the counselors or some of those other, you know, kind of community meetings. They're hard. They're hard. People's schedules are busy. The internet's, I think, the best way to do it, and you, you, you'll get more participation. And sure, I'll, I'll do coffees and, and things like that as well. We do some Zoom meetings. Yeah, and... why not? I mean, okay. whatever people want. Um, I do get disappointed in the level of, of community participation because the only way real change happens is when the community's involved before it's too late, right? Like, let's make an example. I mean, pick an example of, a, of you know, Jim Letary's election was a very big win. It sends a message. And that's political capital. It was like George Bush, George, one of uh, Ronald Reagan's win. He had a lot of political capital. Um, I think this community is going to come out pretty big in this election f because of the fire station, and just because of the buzz I'm hearing on the streets, you know, f in, in every corner about the, the fact that people are tired of the fees, they're tired of costs going up, they're tired of the lack of transparency. If you know, and I'm not suggesting there is a lack of transparency. They're perceived or otherwise there is. Um, but there's a feeling out there. So how do you build that trust? Well, I think I've already got it in many places. Okay. Um, because and how of, have you done that? How through, have you built through that my, trust? Through, through exposing our government uh, in the past two years, exposing our government for some of the things they were doing. They weren't necessarily untoward, but they certainly weren't above board and, and, and uh, um, fully communicated out to the community. Um, and I opened the I opened people's eyes to you know there was an incident with the the former town town manager, I can't get into details about it, but I was able to blow the lid off that thing, and get it out there that there was some inappropriate conduct, and that and that inappropriate that inappropriate conduct ended up costing us some money on the way out the door. By the way, so I want that that's what people are tired of in this town. They they may not talk about it in every circle, but they feel comfortable telling me about it. And and so the town manager that we currently have, he's, he sent us out that Thursday um, newsletter. Yes. And that stuff, and do you feel that's a good communication tool from his perspective? I mean, it's an email, right, that goes out? It's an email, but then you click on it, and it has the full of what's going on. I think it is a very, I think it is a very informational tool. I think it serves its purpose in terms of its um, it's there and people, some people do check their emails. Like I do mm -hmm. check my emails, but I get so many that I'll lose a lot of them. Well, that's true. You, you people are looking more at the text. Texting. All right, let me, we got a couple, one more question and yeah, then I want to give you it. an opportunity. So uh, I want you to give us three words that best describe you and why. Passionate, committed, and aware. Passionate, I think it's pretty obvious, right? Like 
you can see it, you can feel it, it's, it's who I am. Uh, and I'm passionate about the town. I've always been passionate about the kids and doing what's right for the children. Uh, I'm passionate about the community, right? Best communities are built around their churches, synagogues, families of all shapes and sizes uh, all make the best communities when they're in the community. And I think I just sounded like a vice president. Uh, but when they're out, you know, participating in community yeah. events and being neighborly and those sorts of things, committed. I've been up every morning at the bridge waving to, to the voters of Winthrop out of town. I've been door to door just about every day. I've been making phone calls. Um, I've been serving. I've been involved for over 20 years and politically active. As you know, you and I work together. Uh, aware. So growth. A lot of people uh, had a lot of things to say about who I am, but they can't see the growth that I've, that I've made. I'm aware because I know where my weaknesses are. I know the things I need to improve upon. I've shared it with the public, I've owned it, and I'm doing it. Thank you, Todd. Thank I'd like you. to give you an opportunity for any closing statement that you'd like, then you might want to talk into that camera. I will happily talk into that camera. Thank you for watching tonight. I hope I've earned your vote tonight. Please make sure if I have you get out and vote on November 7th. Thank you. I was and I want to thank you all for watching. Just a reminder, November 7th is election day, so please get out and vote. Also, on November 7th at 7.30 p.m., Eric Gaynor and I will be hosting election night, so please tune in. Thank you.